Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday. Gosh, April. It's almost May. April 20th, 2017. And this is the week in charge. This is the fastest year I ever remember. Obviously, I want to thank you guys and girls for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I'm humbled by your presence. So what are we going to talk about? Well, I'm going to continue my discussion about the market. Um, last year and early this year, we talked about it being a bull market. And I talked a little bit about, eh, you got to be careful when you label these things. And then, of course, the market's gone a little sideways. And the bears came out of the woodwork, and it's the end of the world. It's like, eh, I don't think it's the end of the world just yet. But we'll uh, flesh that out in quite a bit of detail. Uh, your questions on trading, uh, keep them base, keep them uh, related to the slides. Well, I want the slides if you don't mind. Uh, but you could certainly ask about anything that you may might be on your mind. Uh, stock picks. Hold off on your stock picks until we get to the charts. That's for your benefit so they don't get buried in the questions. And then ask about one ticker at a time and hit return. And that's also for your benefit. If you ask about four or five of them at a time, I won't be able to keep track of which ones are covered and which ones I haven't. So uh, make sure you do that. Uh, I want to follow up a little bit on IPOs. I'm not going to spend too much time on that this week, but I do want to continue to follow up on that. I think it's a good thing to follow up on. Um, we're going to show, this is left in left in there from last week. I'll probably touch upon this a little bit, but this isn't going to be the focus this week, so I should, should have taken that out. This week's focus is going to be more on traits of successful traders. And then I got to think right before I went public with this um, announcement of today's or the newsletter to announce today's show. What good is me telling you these traits without giving you some tips on how to acquire them? So hopefully I'll be able to do that too. There's a disclaimer screen as you know you can lose money trading or as I like to sum it up all predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So let's follow up on Snapcraft, one of these um, hyped IPOs. And if you go back a few weeks in the week of charts, and um, on my website, even uh, more specifically, uh, I talked about what would happen if you use the five-day moving average in daylight, meaning that the low is greater than the moving average as a system for buying IPOs. And my theory there is that if they don't go up, don't buy them. And I thought it would be kind of fun to just uh, put out a little simple system. And I have even more, I have an even more simpler system in my IPO course, but I wanted something easy to recognize some fairly mechanical rules just to see what would happen. And to my surprise, it works quite well, at least so far. And it does happen to help when you're in an IPO bull market like we're in now. But the rules are pretty simple. It has to be a new closing high and low has to be greater than the five day moving average. And that five day moving average, you cannot trade until day six. And like I said, you, you got to let them establish themselves a little bit. You have to let them establish themselves a little bit before looking to trade them. So you can't look to trade them until day six when you actually have a moving average on a chart. And so far, Snapcrap has been uh, an abysmal failure. So I don't want to get too much in, more into the system right now or the, what do you want to call it, the setup. So you can go in and take a look at the last few weekend charts for more on that and then obviously on my um, website oh yeah this is what I was referring to I was confused when I saw this earlier my apologies uh, I want to continue to talk about following up on the methodology yeah this is a follow-up that we've been doing for quite a while um, a few months back back on I think it was February 7th yeah February 7th I was pointing out the fact that the portfolio was on the cusp of going negative. In fact, without this one closed trade in here, remember this first half, the ones in white or swing trade that have hit the initial profit target, and the ones in yellow or trend following mode, or the rest of the position, I should say, that's in trend following mode. And we were on the cusp of going negative. And my point was, well, let's just continue to follow the plan and see what happens. And as Ed Sakota once saying, you get a whip and I get a saw, one good trend pays for them all. And my point was, well, stay tuned, it ain't it over yet. The fat lady hasn't sung just yet. So if we fast forward to last night, 
And I'm not adding in new positions. I'm just going to follow up on those positions that were in that portfolio. And unfortunately, the salt actually stopped out a little while ago, at least on a mechanical basis. And we'll take a look at that when we get to the live charts. But you can see that we were at about a $500 gain. And again, that's because we had one closed position in there too, half a closed position. And then as of last night, it was at 38.55. Okay, I think that's down a little bit from last week based on this uh, part of the portfolio, not counting the open trades and the closed trades since February 7th. But again, I wanted to follow up. And then, as I said, and here's the word hold, but hopefully we'll be in these for a long, long time. Unfortunately, salt just stopped out, but uh, Kim's still chugging along. And CCJ is eh, still a stinker, but it might uh, turn into something. So for now, we get to say bye, Felicia, one more week. What do you think about using your 220 EMA strategy on the IPOs? I think that's a good strategy. I think it would work. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. And what I like about coming in, and that's where the 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 daylight concept comes from, is from waiting for those, waiting for the stock to, for the low to be above the moving average. And the great thing about that is a moving average, as you know, can have lag. It can take a while to roll over or turn back up. But by requiring daylight, all you're saying is that the low has to be greater than the moving average. So that's a price-based pattern. So if a market begins to take off, it will begin to accelerate away from its moving average. So yeah, I think it, it, it could work. And one thing that I kind of backed into accidentally by showing this little simple system, and that's how the whole 220 EMA system got started to begin with. Um, if you're not familiar with 220 EMA system, just Google it. Uh, you used to have to pay stocks and commodities $1.97 for the for the PDF, but now it seems to be all over the Internet, so you should be able to find it. If you can't find it, let me know. Basically, we're just looking for a two-day breakout away from the EMA, the 20-day EMA. Now, the downside of waiting for the 20-day EMA, EMA would, would be that you'd have to wait a month before you could actually trade the stock. I've had a huge breakout trader, and this 220 EMA is a slight uh, breakout characteristic to it, but with IPOs, breakouts can work, and I do have some patterns that are somewhat breakout in nature with the IPO. So, so yes, I think you're definitely on to something there. I think it could work. Um, you know, it's something that I don't need to look at. I need to kind of look at my own stuff when it comes to that. One thing I do like about the five day, if you're if you're playing the uh, buy at B pattern, uh, one problem with that is that I have a rule that you need to be more than um, I'm sorry, less than twenty dollars a share. Uh, for that pattern. And one thing, and this is sort of uh, based on my observations of the past several years, or at least several years going into the IPO course, the somewhat lower priced IPOs tend to offer more opportunities because the underwriter priced them more likely to price them more, um, what's the word, left some meat on the bone or, or didn't price them too high. As I often say, if the price too high, they die. So my observation is twenty dollars, and keep in mind that could be, that could change with time. But that's the general rule uh, when it comes to the um, IPOs. So the um, sorry about that. Okay. So one thing, getting back to the to the uh, the five day. EMA, oh, I'm sorry, five day. What did I call this thing? I forget what they even call the pattern. Um, Dave Landry's five day awesome IPO moving average trader. But getting back to that five day thing, the cool thing about that is uh, I have no price requirements on it. So what could happen is uh, much higher stocks, price stocks, when they do begin to take off, could, uh, could trigger this pattern. And I think I used Ferrari as an example a while back because the stock just absolutely died for a while. But then when it began to take off again, that pattern uh, triggered. And again, we don't have a price thing on it. So I don't want to digress too far. But uh, to answer your question, yeah, I think it could work. And I think it's something that might be worth uh, taking a look at. All right. So did we say bye, Felicia? Yeah, we said bye, Felicia. Okay. Um, tips of traits of successful traders and tips on how to acquire them now 
some nights I'll think about for days what I want to talk about in this show, and other other nights I'm like, what the heck am I going to talk about? And last night was one of those nights, and I woke up this morning thinking, well, we're going to talk about. There's not a whole lot to talk about because the market is just stuck in this stupid sideways range. So obviously I need to talk about patience and how that's such a good trait to have. And it got me to thinking while I was waiting for the coffee to brew, I started scribbling on a notepad some of these traits of successful traders. And obviously patience is probably the highest on the list. And you've probably seen me write about patience more than, than all of the above combined. And then right before I went to go live here today, I got to thinking about, well, what good is it for me to tell you about these traits if I don't tell you a little bit on how to acquire them? Now, you have to be accountable when it comes to trading. I was thinking about it this morning. <laughs> I used to work at this plant many, many years ago, uh, early in my fairly early in my computer science career. There, I remember something was really effed up, and... Um, and I raised my hand and said, that's my fault. The plant manager like points at me and stands up. And I was like, oh, crap, he's getting ready to let me have it. <laughs> he goes, you see, that's just the kind of attitude we need. You know, someone that's willing to admit their mistakes, to be held accountable. And then I got to thinking, maybe I should admit all the other stuff I effed up. And I was like, eh, you know what, might as well leave on a high note. But you have to be accountable. And my favorite, somewhat more recent story here, as I've already told several times, is I have a client who's a good stock picker, who understands markets, who understands money management, who understands position management. He gets it. He understands my system. And every now and then he'll call me up and say, man, I really get this. I really love this, you know. But over the past few years, and let's hope he's, he's, he's gotten rid of some of these bad behaviors, but over the past few years I've seen him go through this cycle of up and down where and he's fairly wealthy, and he'll he'll fund a fairly small account relative to his wealth, and then he'll he'll do fairly well for a while, and then he'll he'll blow it up or or get into a downward spiral. But the the bottom line is he knows he knows what he's doing wrong. As Livermore once said, a speculator sometimes makes mistakes and knows that he's making them. So finally, I just said, okay, look, you know what you're doing, you're just not doing it. What would happen if you got your wife involved with the process and said, okay, babe, here's the plan. This is what I'm going to do. This is why I'm going to do it. This is the setup. I've been trading the setup for a while. It's a good setup. It may or may not work, but I think it's worth a shot. And here's my exact trading plan. And so I said, would you be willing to get your wife involved? And he says, oh, no that would end the marriage. So that right there tells me that he's not willing to admit, or at least wasn't really willing to admit what he was doing wrong. Now, the last email exchange I had with him, it sounds like he's he's back on the right track and doing the right thing. But you have to be accountable. I recently went on a diet, very recently, this week, in fact, because it's it's time. Fat Dave is P is no longer P H A T Dave. It's it's just plain old Fat Dave. It's not even Big Dave anymore. It's Fat Dave. So I was reading. Uh, of course, you know, whenever I do something, I got to read a book about it. <laughs> and one of the things they pointed out was accountability. And they gave the example of someone who who made a bet with someone, uh, and and kind of did a little um, what do you call it, jaw jacking or whatever with them as as the as he begin to achieve his goals. Um, holding yourself accountable makes a big difference. My wife all, is also on a diet, so I have that support mechanism, and I, I'm, I'm kind of accountable. So I, I know that I can't eat whatever I want. Not that she's going to watch me or anything, but I know that she's also doing it, and she'll notice it. So I feel like I, I have to be held accountable, and I'll give you the example a, a trader friend of mine was getting kind of fat from sitting around his monitors all day and uh, sitting around watching his monitors. And he said, you know what I did, Dave? This is what I did to make sure that I went to the gym. He found someone who was much younger than him 
and 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 starving like a kid almost and said here's the deal I'm gonna pay for your gym membership and I'll pay for your gas to drive me to the gym and I want you to ride by my house every day at 605 and if I'm not on the front porch waiting for you to pick me up I'm gonna give you twenty dollars and this kid gladly accepted it and I think he, he probably was already a um, training to begin with so he held himself accountable so how do you hold yourself accountable well there's, there's a few ways the the hardest thing would be in the utmost it would cause the utmost discipline which we'll talk about in just one minute is just to hold yourself accountable okay you have to trade like someone's watching for me it's fairly easy because I, I put out a daily game plan and a couple things. It's, it's like I, I need to follow my own plan. Otherwise, I'd, I'd feel like a big hypocrite. Um, pretend someone's watching. Pretend you have to report to someone. If you have, if you're brave enough, you have the cojones, then get your spouse or significant other involved. So find a partner, find a friend, get your spouse involved, or just do it. Trade like someone is watching. So whenever I feel like, oh, well, this thing has gone past my stop and it's more than a discretionary call, I didn't bother getting out, what should I do? It's like, well, I cannot let that position continue to go against me. Otherwise, that would make me this big old hypocrite. So you got to hold yourself accountable. Good traders are very accepting and if you have kids you know that sometimes you have to tell them you get what you get and you don't throw a fit you have to be willing to, to take what the market is offering you cannot try to force anything and that's we're going to come back to patience here in one second but you could see that very early on that all of these are interrelated so you can't try to force something to happen that's not there. You have to accept what the market is willing to give you. Right now, the market is just chopping sideways. You have to accept that. And I'm getting a little further ahead of myself, but unless you're Bill Clinton, what is, is. I think your, your phraseology can help here and just observe what's happening. Um, also, you have to embrace and accept the fact that all trades will eventually end badly. So you're either going to stop out at a loss, and if you do, make sure you do a post-mortem to make sure that was a good trade to begin with going in. You're going to make money on a swing trade and stop out at a scratch or maybe something a little bit better, maybe a small profit, but nothing to write home about. Or you're going to make money on a swing trade and you're going to capture the mother of all trends, but in the end it's going to end badly. You're going to give up some of those open profits. So the point I was trying to get to earlier is your, your phraseology about that and being accepted. And I'm kind of like all of these things can kind of blur together a little bit. But you could just say, oh, that's interesting, and I accept what the market gave me. And for that, I'm, I'm gracious. Which brings us to our next topic, being gracious. I'm a big fan of this self-motivation, self-help, rah, rah, rah type of stuff. Um, I've read... Uh, Tony Robbins, I've uh, recently, I'm reading this, uh, a lot of Tim Ferriss, who I'm, I'm becoming a big fan of. He does a podcast with a lot of successful people. So I'm, I'm a big fan of, of studying success and learning about these things and what makes these successful people tick and what, what traits can I pick up, what habits can I pick up from them. And one reoccurring theme is gratitude and you could go you could go way back in this you can go all the way back to was it uh wallace waddles the science of getting rich 
which is kind of a spacey book, but it, 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 there's a lot of interesting things in that. And I think gratitude is one of them. You have to be gracious. And the, a lot of this, a lot of this being gracious, and maybe you're, um, you guys out there that are, that are Asian can help me out a little bit, but it seems like recently I was listening to some podcast where it, it seems like the reoccurring theme within the Asian culture is being gracious. They're gracious for, they're gracious when they come home, they're gracious for their house, they're gracious that they have a house to, 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 to leave and to come back to. So gratitude and being gracious are very important things. And so along the lines of accepting, if you make a profit on a trade, you need to accept the market's giving you and you need to, you need to think the market, okay? So physically, and I'm just kind of thinking out loud here, but you could actually physically think the market. And I'm actually kind of like when I make money on a trade and I stop out, I try not to get angry at the fact that I stopped out of a trade. But on the other hand, or I should say, but rather, I'm like, I'm gracious that I was able to capture this trade. I'm gracious that I had the knowledge to find this trade in the first place. So I think gratitude and being gracious are really good traits. And it's like, well, right before I came uh, or started the show, I should say, uh, right before I came back to my office, I got to thinking like, well, should you be, should you be gracious if you get stopped out on a trade? Because I was wondering, you know, what if somebody says, well, should I be happy about that? Well, I'm not saying be happy about it. But be gracious in that the market took you out of a bad position or it took you out of a, a good position that's no longer good. So, yeah, if you get stopped out, I mean, you're never going to feel great about it, but learn to feel like it's part of the process. And, again, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. We'll get to that. You have to be agnostic. Don't confuse the issue with facts is what I often say. So you really have to be agnostic as far as your feelings towards the market. Earlier, I kind of alluded to the fact that you don't want to label yourself as a bull or a bear. You want to come in and be agnostic. And this is some slides from this course I'm working on. But unless you're Bill Clinton, what is, is. Again, that's kind of a reoccurring theme. And one thing I was talking about is in the course is that you shouldn't justify the price of a stock. Let me rephrase that. You shouldn't ever have to justify the price of a stock. The price of the stock, the ask, is the lowest amount that someone is going to sell it to you. And then the value of the stock, the bid, is whatever someone will pay you for it. So what is is? And you have to be agnostic in that you don't want to be biased too much towards one side or the other, unless there's an obvious uptrend, obvious downtrend. Right now, uh, obvious longer-term trend, obvious intermediate-term side tr sideways trend. So you have to make sure you act accordingly. And you don't want to paint yourself into a corner with one side or the other. You have to be kind of agnostic and just take things as they come. I think one of the great traits of traders, or all good traders, must be good planners. You have to plan your trade and trade your plan. I know it's cliche, and, you know, first thing that comes to mind is Mike Tyson once said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face, although I recently read it was his trainer who said that, so I'm not sure exactly who's who, but I think... Uh, it's been attributed to Mike Tyson quite a bit. And that's the tough part is actually following that plan. But if you do have a solid plan in place, then you could bypass some of the emotions or maybe the emotional part of your brain, I should say, to get to the rest of what's sloshing around up there and just follow your plan. So
this is your brain and that's your amygdala okay I don't know if that's exact to scale but there's a lot sloshing around up here and down in your I guess it's your cerebral cortex somewhere down here you got this little bitty amygdala and that's the very emotional part of your brain or that is the emotional part of your brain so it's very helpful when you're getting ready to get hit by a cab to say, hey, jump out the way. I'm about to get killed. How about that? So <laughs> it really will help you out. But if you're making a snap decision in your trades, it can really screw you up. Now, it only takes a second or two to, to bypass the amygdala and get to the rest of the stuff that's sloshing around up there. And as I often say, if you're getting ready to have a little quip back at your spouse, don't say anything, count to three, and see if you'll still say it. Now, sometimes you might say it. It might be worth it, you know. That's a whole other story. But I would be willing to bet 90% of the time you won't. And I think the, the study I talk about that's talked about in these behavioral finance books is when Google put a retract on the email, well, it was so successful they had to retract the retract, basically, because people would have enough time to think about what they just wrote and said, and they pulled it back. Probably saved a lot of people from being fired. I have a little, I don't know if you can hear it or not, but I have a little, uh, I have a little aviation clock. I wrote about this a few weeks back. Greg Morris, when he was in the flight simulators, for fighter pilots, for me to fire the pilot, and he eventually became a um, Top Gun trainer. And back then, what they would do, and they still do it today, I'm guessing, is they all these bells and whistles and alarms go off. They try to create this panic situation in you. And in that panic state, you might shut down the wrong engine. I was talking to him once about when he lost an engine. And uh, they started having generator problems in the plane or something. And the, uh, the co-pilot was like, you want me to shut down that, that bad engine? He's like, no, 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 no. Just, just relax. You know, you can shut the generator down, shut that off, but do not shut off the bad engine because in that moment of excitement, you might actually shut off the good engine. So what Greg, that was an actual situation. But what Greg, the way Greg said he got around it was to, was to wind a clock. So what he would do, and back, back then they actually had an analog clock on the plane. So when the bells and buzzers and everything starts going off, he would recenter himself by reaching over and winding the clock. Now those, that second or two it took to wind a clock was enough for him to relax and assess the situation by using his full brain and not just the emotional part of his brain. So if you have a plan in place, then you know what to do. You just have to do it. I know, easier said than done. But for me, and it seems a little weird, I have a bit of an out-of-body experience. This morning, for example, I had a, um, it, it, a, a stop would be a better example, but this morning, for example, I knew I had to make a trade, and the easiest way for me to do it was put a stop entry order in, and I placed a trade. And I, I, for a second here, I couldn't remember what stock it was because you just go into this automatic mode where you do the right thing. Now, stops is for stop losses or even a better way of doing it. You just have, I mean, a better way of, of giving you an example of that where you know you have to put a stop in or you know if your stop has been exceeded and it's obviously not a discretionary call, then you have to bail out, okay? So for me, sometimes I'll do things and then wonder what I did later. And as we'll get to in just one second, rarely do I remember what positions I'm actually in. And this is especially true when it comes to something like currencies. For me, a dollar yen or a euro NZD or whatever, it has no meaning to me. I've become detached, and it's just a symbol, and, and that's why I can never remember what I'm in because I don't think about it. I think of it like the sardine analogy. I think about it as something that you trade, 
and not that it is a country's currency versus another country's currency. So you have to plan ahead of time and you have to know and embrace. It's not enough time to get into it completely today, but obviously I just touched upon those physiological things that are part of our makeup that go against the trading. And that's the that's the amygdala. And just bypass the amygdala, wind a clock, think for a few seconds, think rationally, count to three. Whatever trick or tip it takes you to get to the rest of what's sloshing around up there. And again, if you could you could begin to start having these out of body experiences where you place the order without thinking about it too much, without trying to get those emotionals, emotional emotions involved too much. Every trade is going to be emotional. That's a fact. But if you try not to think about it too much and just do what has to be done. Now, there are certain things you could do if you are, and we're going to get to patience here in just one second, but if you're watching a screen too much and you're micromanaging yourself out of positions, turn off your screens. Go for a walk. As one of my clients once said, when things are just kind of treading one, he goes, well, I'm going to go find something far more interesting to do. And he's retired. So if you're retired, you could certainly find something far more interesting to do, which will keep you from micromanaging and not following your plan. If you're in a stock, and let's say your stop is here and the stock's, let's say the stock's way up here, you're in longer term trend following mode, you can place a hard stop and go about your business. Go back to the beginning of this presentation and go back and watch the last, I don't know how many, I guess eight or nine or however many it's been since two, since uh, February 7th. And you'll see that the only thing you had to do was to sit on those positions. Other than, Up until pretty much today, I think you had to take a little action in, the, in one of them. But for the most part, there was nothing to do. And that's why I say, hey, it's the hardest, easiest thing that you'll ever do. <laughs> Phil says, hey, it gives me an idea. Can I find something far more interesting to listen to this cage? And sadly, no. Oh, man, that's pretty bad if I'm the, if I'm the most exciting thing you can find. Huh? Well, I appreciate that. All right, patience is what, again, I originally wanted to talk about this morning. And this is a reoccurring theme with me. And there's two types of patience. One is to let the market come to them. That's what a good patient trader does. And not try to make something happen. And it's tough. And I know it's tough. And, you know, here it goes again. I guess I need some new stories. But way back... In the trading market days, when by accident I ended up doing a service, someone had had left that was doing a service and asked me if I would do a service. I'm like, yeah, I'll do a service. And early in the service days, I found out that we didn't lose clients when I recommended crappy stocks. We lost clients when I didn't recommend anything. And the salespeople would actually call me up and say, Dave, you haven't recommended anything in a couple of weeks. We're losing clients. So that made me realize that people are craving action. It's kind of like the, reminds me of the bear story. You know, hunter goes into the woods, a hunter bear, and feels a little tap on his shoulder, and the bear has his way with him. And then, you know, hunter goes back in the woods again, bear hunting, and all of a sudden the bear taps him on the shoulder and has his way with him. Finally, about the fourth time, Bear taps him on the shoulder and says, you're not out here for the hunting, are you? <laughs> and that and that's, was an, an interesting lesson for me. These people aren't there to make money. They're there for action. And that's, that's hard because successful people are people of action, as I said, ad nauseum. Now, the other patience is for the market to move. I just said a few minutes ago, sometimes just turn off your screens. And that's a simple thing to do. Turn off your screens. Walk away. And as I've said, ad nauseum, I, you know, I don't do it anymore, actually. Uh, but I used to watch every little tick of every little stock. You know, I've got six monitors here. I'm still watching quite a bit. But I used to really, really be bad about it. And um, Craig and I were talking, and it, it, he was saying, um, 
you know, one of the problems is uh, Craig's a client of mine, and we were talking, and he was talking about how his quote screens, when the red is flashing, like red, 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 it just it just kind of sucks you into action. And what I actually did on my, and he was talking about making his quote screen monochrome, and what I actually did years ago was I changed like the um, the red to cyan. So it wasn't such a, a big, it was kind of like a shades of green and blue on my screen as opposed to this red, 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 red. And, you know, little things like that you could do to kind of kind of trick yourself or, or not put yourself into that, that state of emergency can help. But a lot of times just walk away. Uh, one problem that you'll find, people who decide, oh, I'm going to trade full time, at least for me, the biggest problem I found was, the constant micromanaging and being too close to the market. As I often say, you want to be as close to the market as you need to be, but no closer. And if you're watching every little single tick, it, it becomes a lot, a lot bigger than it really is. I get emails all the time. I got a few emails last week. It was a volatile stock bouncing around. The stock normally bounces around 10, 15% a day. And they're like emailing me, Dave, it's up 12%. It's like, oh, okay, well, it's, that's what it normally does. That's what it does, you know. But they're watching every little tick. And if you watch every little tick, eventually you're going to micromanage yourself out of some really good positions. And it hasn't happened that often, but we've had a few stocks over the years that have been bought out. And it's kind of interesting. I can think of one or two particular cases where the stock just flatlined for a month. And I guarantee you 90% of the people that were in it probably exited because it was doing absolutely nothing. It was a so-called dead money, and then it gets bought out. So you're going to have to have patience to let the markets come to you, and you're going to have to have patience to let the markets move. And those two things are a lot easier said than done. And my trick there is to keep myself stupid busy. I don't know how in the world I'm ever going to accomplish everything I want to accomplish outside of the markets. I have, um, I'm looking at my studio right now. It's collecting dust. I need to get over there, uh, dust it off, and I need, to, I need to do 15 videos. I've got 15 videos left of the course. I have all kinds of things that need to be done. I keep myself incredibly busy. I rarely say no to an interview, a podcast, uh, an article, or whatever when asked. I finally said, I finally actually put somebody off for the first time I can remember in 10 years, a few days ago. But rarely do I ever do that because I like to keep myself stupid busy. And that keeps me from doing the wrong thing. So keep yourself crazy busy. Find some excitement outside of the markets. Now, along the lines of patience, Livermore has a plethora of quotes, and I just pulled up a few this morning. One of his more famous ones, it was never my thinking that made the big money for me. It was always the sitting. Now, people have misconstrued this quote to mean that sitting in positions and he has some other quotes as we'll see that that are probably a little bit more related to that this quote here is the patience on waiting for the market is what many people believe he really wanted to say as opposed to the conventional wisdom which thinks that oh it's just sitting in the positions so by that it's like waiting for your pitch and along those lines he also said Money is made by sitting, not trading. Now, this one could be a little bit more construed as, construed, construed, that's, is that a word? <laughs> I have to look that up. It feels like, some days I feel like I'm construed. Anyway, money is made by sitting, not trading. So this is a little bit more of, I think, being patient in the market. And the real money is in longer term trends. The real money is in those triple digit gains that don't come along every day, but if you're sitting around waiting long enough till you get the position and then stick with the position till you get the setup, stick around long enough till you get the setup and then stick with the setup until proven otherwise, that's where the real money is. 
And this one, I think, kind of really gives the point or, or really illustrates the point of sticking with the winning position. Margin call. So men who could be both right and sit tight or uncommon, and that's why I'm going through this spreadsheet every week, every week, every week, every week to see what's going to happen. And I hate to use the word hope, but I'm hoping that that stock, that piece of crap in the portfolio that has just chopped sideways for the last two months, I'm hoping that it's just consolidating, it takes off. And I'm also hoping, and I know there's a lot of hope in those sentences, but I'm also hoping that that stock that has gone sideways at high levels that we have 60% profit in, I'm hoping that it breaks out of that base and takes off into space. And I'm hoping that turns into a, a triple-digit gain, so I have the mother of all examples. Now, this one was new to me. I don't remember reading this in... Reminiscence of a Stock Operator or the other books that I've read about Live the More. So if one of you guys knows where this quote came from, let me know. But don't give me timing, give me time. And that's the hard part, is giving yourself time. You obviously have to give yourself enough time to wrap your head around the markets and understand that they go up and they also go down. And sometimes they go sideways. If you don't know anything about the markets and you know those three things, you know a lot. And you'd be surprised. I was at a cocktail party a while back. And uh, somebody told me, well, yeah, I sold all my stocks because I thought they were high. And that was like in October. And over the next couple of months, what happened? The stocks went straight up, you know. And so... So it's like, well, you know, it's, it seems to be going higher. He had sold in October. It was now November, December. I forget when the party was. It might have been early January. Anyway, so I'm like, well, you know, market's going higher. Like, so should I, should I wait for it to go back down? Should I buy as it starts going down? I'm like, no. <laughs> if it's going up, you want to be in. If it's going down, you want to be out. So people have a hard time with that. But if you can wrap your head around the fact that markets go up, markets go down, and markets go sideways, and then work to understand what trend it's in. It's not always easy, but most of the time, it's pretty blatant. And again, right now, I think longer-term uptrend still intact, sideways trend still intact. I mean, sideways shorter-term trend, short-term and medium-term trend. Longer-term, still an uptrend. But, you know, it's amazing, and like I wrote recently, I saw someone call a top for months and months and months and months and months. And now the market's going sideways. They're like, aha, I'm vindic vindic vin vindicated. Where's my mouth today? <laughs> Can that form a sentence? You know, they predict early and often, and they let the ego get involved. Obviously, you have to be disciplined in your trading. And there's different ways to acquire discipline. But one way is you could fake it until you make it, okay? Assuming that you found a decent setup. And I was kind of thinking about that a lot because I'm trying to, this beginner's course has become more than that. And I'm trying to think of a name for it. And somebody suggested successful trading in 60 days. It's like, well, but your stock picking could, it's going to be a little tough to get your stock picking right in just 60 days, but you certainly could find a simple setup and follow that one setup and just that one setup. I have a couple of clients right now. They're following along on trading service, but they're also doing one or two very simple things in IPOs and they're doing quite well with it. So maybe you can at least become proficient in one or two small areas and then move on from there. But assuming that you have the discipline to pick the stocks and know that you're picking the good stocks, then the big discipline comes in to following the plan. And the way you do that is you could fake it until you make it. You could fake that discipline, okay? You could say, well, I don't know what to do, but my plan says I need to stop here, so you put the stop in. I don't know what to do, my plan says to take these partial profits. And as I've said quite often, 
one one of my salvations throughout life was if I don't I don't know what to do, but if I did know what to do, this is what I would do. And I ask myself that all the time. And it's a great way of turning a negative into a positive. I've and I've accomplished a lot of things. My wife calls me hobby boys, and I've done some amazing things with my hobbies. I'm not bragging because I was I had zero mechanical inclination very early on, but I learned quite quickly how to do these things. Because I asked myself, if I didn't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it, but if I didn't know how to do it, what would I do? So ask yourself that over and over. And if you don't know what to do, what if you did? Well, you do because you have a plan going in. And the hardest part of trading once you become disciplined is actually finding that trade to begin with. I can help you on that and I can teach you how to do that. So you could you could take that part out of the equation and then focus on your discipline while you're learning how to pick the proper stocks and recognize the patterns. And then once you get good at doing that, then you need to keep me on staff. You don't want to fire me, especially if I'm doing okay. So I can help you with that learning curve. And the way you get discipline is to just do it. Get those repetitions in. Now, but Dave, how can I do it? I'm, I'm all over the place. Well, first thing you do, as I've said more recent times, is just on one trade and only one trade. That's the next trade, okay? You've already planned it out. That's the easy part, okay? It's very. It takes me about 20 seconds to plan a trade. I eyeball it. So that's ah, bouncing around about three points a day. Let's give it about a five-point stop. So there's plenty of room. Bam. That's it. Okay. Uh, I don't want to enter right above the high because I don't want a market maker to to, to trick to trick me in. So I'm gonna enter above maybe a two-day high or three-day high, and then I already know where my stop is. So I just add that to my entry, and then that's my initial profit target. That's it. Takes me 20, 30 seconds max to plan a trade. Okay. Maybe a little longer if it's kind of a volatile stock and I want to figure out what's the least amount of room I could give it. Okay. But for the most part, it doesn't take very long to plan a trade. So just follow the plan. I know, just do it, right? Easy said to dud. But this is how you do it. Just do it on one trade. If you think about the enormity of all this discipline on all these trades, it's a little overwhelming, but if you could just do it on one trade, okay, just just make a pact with yourself, or better yet, hold yourself accountable through a trading partner or your spouse and say, hey, you know what, I'm going to take this trade if it triggers, I'm going to put in a stop after it triggers, I'm going to take profits at this level, and then I'm going to trail a stop, and this is how I'm going to trail a stop, and then go on and do it. So hold yourself accountable, or better yet, have somebody else Hold your accountable and just do it for one trade. Now, the problem is, what if it turns into a losing trade? Well, so what? You you did what had to be done, and you're going to have to reward yourself possibly outside of the obviously, ob obviously outside of the market. So find some kind of small reward to give yourself for following that plan. I don't know what that reward is going to look like for you, but maybe a nice dinner or, or go out, play some golf or, or do whatever. Do whatever you do, but but reward yourself for following that plan on just that one trade. And then rinse and repeat. And, of course, you've got to come back. I guess the next thing, maybe next week I'll talk about good traders are reflective. So you need to go back and reflect on what you did and make sure you did pick that good stock going in. Make sure that it was intuition and not intuition. Good traders are humble, okay? And, you know, I think the reason I talk about psychology so much is, is I struggle. Uh, and I think everybody who trades struggles. And if, if, you know, you meet somebody who's cocky, they're either full of shit or delusional. And, and that's, I, I don't have a better way of putting it. And I, I'll, I knew a trader that no matter what, if the market was going up, he was long. But if it had a sharp reversal, all of a sudden he shorted that reversal. And it started going down, he was short. So no matter what happened, he was always 
trading correctly and making a lot of money. And he's just full of bull. And and I knew that. But it took me a while to embrace that because this person was uh, a lot smarter than I was. So good traders are home. I mean, <laughs> last week I was bragging to a fellow trader about how I've been printing money, doing this some of this Forex stuff. And guess what? That was the exact peak. <laughs> of my account so you know that's the perverse thing about this whenever you start feeling really good like I got this the market humbles you shortly thereafter so be humble to begin with and your life becomes a lot easier be willing to accept what the market is going to give you now on the flip side you also have to be flippant and for some reason I have a hard time trying to explain this concept of being flippant. And you have to be disciplined in your action. You have to be humbled and willing to accept what the market is giving you or even not giving you. But you have to be flippant in your approach. It is what it is. So what? So be it. You have to be able to walk away and be okay. You have to not care what you're trading, okay? If you if you told me right now to name the portfolio, I would have to think really hard. I know we're long CCJ because it's a stinker. It's bothering me. I know we're long Kim because I remember that one because it's in a really good trend. But, like, the rest of them, I have a hard time figuring out what we're long or what we're not long. And that's because... You just can't care. And like I said, the currencies, uh, I know I'm short the Japanese yen right now, dollar yen, and I'm long something else. I can't think. I'm short the yen, dollar, and I can't think of what I'm long. And, and I'm not just playing along right now. I literally don't know what I'm long. Um, I can't, you know, I'm purposely not checking my screen to see if I can remember. And I can't. I swear. I cannot remember what I'm long. So if I don't even know what I'm trading, why should I? That just shows you how I've reached a point where it, I'm going to use the word try. It's not that I don't completely care, but I try not to care. You have to reach a point where you take the necessary action without any remorse. And then I probably should add or reasoning. Do what has to be done. And then just do it. <laughs> For some reason, I was thinking about that. <laughs> I think I told this last week that at that same plant, which was a miserable experience, which um, is why I'm here now. So if you if you think you, if you're in a situation where you just you, where there's no there's no hope, congratulations, you've you've reached a point where you're getting ready to have a breakthrough and move on because until you reach that. If I if I was happy out there, I'd probably still be out there doing that, you know. I plan closed down, so I guess that's a hypothetical statement. But I was so frustrated with the situation, it encouraged me to just get out and take a chance. And I'm like, what's the worst case thing could happen? I could fail miserably. Uh, I can get another job. I was looking for a job when I got the job, you know. <laughs> anyway, you have to take any necessary action without remorse. And what where I was going with this was. We interviewed a guy to to, uh, to run the um, computers during the week, and on the week he was going to be an operator. And I was like, oh, I forgot to ask him if he'd worked on if he'd work on Saturdays on occasion. And my boss said, Yeah, I did. It's like, well, what did you say? He said, Worst guys to be did, it's guys to be did. So you have to take the necessary action without any remorse. If it's guys to be did, it's guys to be did. If you got to get out of the stock, you got to get out of the stock. And like I said earlier, I have sometimes I have an out of body experience. I just get out um, along the lines of remorse. I was talking last week with someone, and I said, you know, I I didn't take partial profits on a trade, and I was supposed to. And it's like I just stopped what I was doing. I went in and I did what I was supposed to do. And again, it's kind of like an out of body experience. And then I made the mistake of watching the screen afterwards, and the stock took off right after I got out. And I got to think, it's like, well, wait a minute. Why am I getting sucked into this emotionally? 
I was aggravated initially because the stock began to take off. And I'm like, well, so what? You still have half a position on. So, so what? Don't you want it to go up? Do you want it to go down so you lose money and you feel like, well, at least I was right for a moment? So you have to take the necessary action and have no remorse. Another thing we were talking about is your attitude towards, towards losing trades, okay? When I have a losing trade in the portfolio, and again, we're not going to micromanage. We're not going to feel like it's dead money. We're going to let things work. All those Livermore quotes, we're going to do all that stuff, right? But when a losing trade stops out, I'm like, you know what? I was sick of looking at you anyway. I'm glad you're gone. Now, what a losing trader does is he either keeps that stock in his portfolio or if he finally lets himself stop out, he pulls it up every 10 minutes after he stopped out to see if it begins to take off. If it begins to take off, he gets aggravated. And that's why I try to forget about positions as soon as I, I get out of them. And half the time, especially more recent times, I forget about positions while I'm in them. So you have to take the necessary action without any remorse whatsoever. And then reach a point where you're glad when a stinker stops out because that stock is holding up a piece of your portfolio or, 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 or what should I better word it? It's, it's taking up a slot, okay? It's taking up room. It's taking up space. And once you get rid of it, you now have more capital, capital? capital available to go after new opportunities. There's, there's always going to be a new opportunity. You might have to wait a little while, but there's always going to be more opportunities. You're welcome, William. Ask yourself, who designs trading platforms and what is their interest? Okay, I'm not sure where you're going with that, but I hear what you're saying. Like, are they... Oh, yeah, it's somebody, somebody who's... Yeah, it's a trading... Pl I have a um, problem with Forex. I have these companies get bought out half the time. I forget what happened. But I know, I know what one of them years ago, or at least maybe a year or two ago, last year even, I would get an email saying, you haven't traded in a while. We're going to charge you. It's like, so what? Charge me. Okay, I don't care. I'm flippant. How's that? <laughs> How about that? And they, they, I think what Craig is saying, like, if, if it's a trading platform, they want you to trade. And that's where they make the money, by you trading. You have to be even keeled. It's funny. I was thinking about this this morning. Um, if you think about what even keeled literally means, it means, like, like stable, like, in the middle, I was uh, my brother-in-law, well, ex-brother-in-law, I should say. He's about a biscuit shy of 450, maybe 500, fat bastard. And uh, I don't, there's no love loss there. But anyway, <laughs> um, we were uh, out on a boat once, and I'd sailed up this bayou in the middle of this island, and we camped out for the night. Well, the tide went out, and the boat was balanced on its keel, and fat bastard rolled over. And the bow just, bam, slammed over, and everything from one side fell to the other. I think I was on the on the short end of that stick. I think I was on the downside. But it just shows you that that, that keels is just really deep and really, like, right in the middle there. So you have to be even keel where the highs aren't too high and the lows aren't too low. And, again, that kind of brings you back to, to being flippant, like, ah, Made a lot of money. I don't care. I know it's easier said than done. But this other side is, hey, I lost some money. Eh, I don't care. So you have to be really even keeled in what you're doing. You constant. You have to be a student of the market. And it's like what you know. It's the hard part is uh, what did Socrates say? Uh, you know nothing. <laughs> you know, it's like you come to the realization where you don't know anything. And, and that's the point you eventually reach with the markets. You don't know what they're going to do next. And then you realize that no one knows. But you become fascinated by it. And in some ways, maybe it becomes a game like, how can I continue to follow along? And then for me, I figured out, well, if I loosen up that stop after I got my initial profit, then I could make both a short-term trade and a longer-term trade. 
And it's like in more recent years, it seems like things are a little bit noisier. So I'm going to give the, my positions a little bit more wiggle room on the entry. And that has kept me from being stopped out from noise alone. So this is going to be a constant learning when it comes to the markets and a fascination. Now, this is just a uh, leftover from last week. Just a few things. If you're going to trade, obviously, you're going to need some help. Nobody is fully self-made. I don't care who you are, where you are. I think Arnold Schwarzenegger there to talk about that, too. He had a lot of help along the way. You know, you don't, you don't always think of Nor Arnold Schwarzenegger as the most successful person or whatever, but the, the amount of success that he has achieved is just absolutely mind-boggling when you think about it. And that's one of the things he says is no one's self-made. Margin call. Um, you're going to need money to trade, and even if you have the money, make sure that you allocate it just to trading. And then, once again, here's that support system thing coming back. You need the support of others. And then here's that patience thing. You need a lot of patience. But, Dave, what is the forward PE? <laughs> Moat. I like that. Mother of all trends. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. It's like the mother of all bomb things. I was trying to think of how could I, what could I call it, uh, how could I make a, a play on words with that with trading. William left, uh, but he said he's got a doctor's appointment. He's enjoying the show, and he wants to ask a question uh, and so he can watch recording. No problem. Uh, question on IPO FB and Snap. Bought and sold FP when IPO came out, but ended up selling most of off, kept 300 shares, and now FB is big money. Do you think Snap has long-term value? Uh, well, that's the – you know, that was the – I actually used Facebook as an example in my IPO course, it's like, do you buy them before they come out or what's the long-term value or whatever? And if you look at Facebook, I forget the exact uh, dollar amount. I think it was like 40 bucks a share. And it went down and it just went down, 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 down. So now it's worth a fortune, but what did you do? Well, wait until it goes up before you buy it. They don't go up, don't buy them. Uh, does Facebook have any, any value? I have no idea. I think it's the stupidest stock at stupid town, but getting back to that flip it thing, I don't care. If if Facebook goes on to make new highs or if it bottoms out for months and then makes a bow tie or something, I'm gonna I'm sorry, uh, Snapchat. If Snap goes down and bottoms out for months and then makes a bow tie, I'm gonna I'm gonna buy it, okay? I can care less if if puking a rainbow makes no sense, okay? And that's where becoming flip it comes in. And then as I said earlier, don't confuse the issue with facts. Is it going up? Is it going down? Okay. So, yeah, I have no idea if Snap has any longer-term value to it. Uh, one thing I was thinking about with these things, such as Snapchat or even Facebook, is like initially you sometimes you can't. Now, now just I'm taking off my trading hat for a second. But initially you can't see the value, okay? And down the road, it shows up because Google was a search engine. There was Alta Vista. Alta Vista was a great search engine, you know? Anybody remember Alta Vista? Showing my age. Before that, I had Prodigy, you know? <laughs> um, Yahoo, Alta Vista, there was like a dozen search engines, even way back in the day. It's like, oh, so Yahoo's a search engine. You will be, you know? And you might not be able to see the value at the time. Puking rainbows. I don't see the value in puking rainbows and sending pictures out to your friends. Okay? But there might be some value there. Facebook has a huge value. Facebook is one of the biggest advertising platforms there is. As a friend of mine used to say, or still says, I guess, if you don't know what the product is, it's you. Okay? <laughs> so Facebook is, is a huge company making a fortune on advertising. I mean, I, I might even actually, well, I've actually paid, I've actually placed Facebook ads. I've never really advertised before, but now I advertise a little bit, okay? I used to not bother with marketing, but eh, I can see, you know, I can see the value in that. It's kind of, it's kind of becoming a game with the business, you know? It's like, okay, I'll market a little bit. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm no longer proud, okay? You have to give up your ego to trade. Ah, give my ego to run a business, okay? So there is some value there. So what, What's that value? What's it look like? I have no idea, but you don't have to figure it out. You don't have to know. Uh, Kim, K-E-M, I have no idea what they do. I think they make, I think they make, 
I might have actually bought some of their products. I think they make, I think if it's if it's Kemet, they make uh, semiconductors, capacitors, and stuff like that, right? Uh, but you don't have to know. You don't have to care. I mean, other than what sector they're in. But if they don't go up, don't buy them. Okay. Okay. We'll we'll get to that. We we'll get the stocks. No problem. A decent trader and a wise man does not trade with the wife hanging on his shoulders if he values his marriage. Well, okay. No, I think you have to have. You guys, you, okay, feel free to start asking about stocks now. We're getting ready to jump on the charts. Well, I think you have to hold yourself accountable, and I think that I think that getting your wife involved would be the ultimate accountability. accountability. Um, but, yeah, you don't, you don't have to be that brave, obviously. Now, you wives out there, don't get your husbands involved in your trading. That's been proven to be uh, disastrous, or as my Italian teaches you to say, disastro. Uh, once again, still working on that getting started trading course. I'm actually thinking about it, and there's a lot there. And it's a little bit more than getting started, and I'm trying to come up with a good name for it. And somebody suggested successful trading in 60 days. And I kind of like the ring in that, but if some of you guys have a better idea, let me know. Um, I have enough beta testers, but I guess there's always room for one or two more. So if you guys want to be part of the beta testing on that, uh, feel free. That's part of the learning management system rollout. Uh, hopefully, um, I'll get this beginners and not so much beginners. I'll come back to the beginning type of course out soon. Anyway, let's just hop into the uh, charts. I've pontificated enough here. Okay. Let me show you something real quick. Um, salt, which is in the portfolio, this is the open portfolio right here. We had a stop at 735, and then it came down to 728 this morning. So that's what I would call a stop, Nick. Okay. So it's okay in a case like this to give them a little bit of wiggle room. Just don't throw caution to the wind. And we've talked quite a bit about, I think 735 is like right, let's say about right there. Okay. Now it might take that out with vigor later on today. And that's fine. If it does, it does. But as you get more disciplined, it's okay to apply a little discretion to your trades and give them a little bit of wiggle room, especially when they're nearing a stop like that. Now, don't throw caution to the wind, okay? But be willing to give them a little bit of wiggle room to see if they immediately turn around, okay? But mechanically, this will come out of the portfolio. And when you see my little update next week, a little fat lady update, you'll see that come out too. I'm sorry. Yeah, it'll come out of the live trades and go into the uh, closed trades, okay? So I track things mechanically to keep people from, what's the word, from questioning things. But in real life, I believe in using a little discretion on your trade. Now, it does take discipline, again. All right, let's take a look at the overall market real quick, and then we got we got enough time to get into your um, individual stocks. So let's do that. Next, uh, so keep asking, keep the keep the picks coming. I'm uh, I'll get to those. Okay, let's take a look at a piece. And let's get off a 10 minute chart so we don't get too caught up in what's going on. Although I wouldn't mind looking at an hourly just for stuffs and giggles, S and Gs. So let's take a look at this just for fun. Let's take a look at an hourly. Yeah, hourly chart looks like we're trying to turn back up on the hourly. Look at that. We could have a bow tie. It's a little sloppy, so not a whole lot to gleam there. But let's go back to the daily before I digress too far. Uh, you could see, as I said last week, the bow ties are a little sloppy. By sloppy, I mean they're just kind of meandering back and forth. You want to see them come together really tight at a fulcrum point, okay? And this fulcrum point ideally is over two to three days. Hopefully, we'll get a good example or two uh, in your stock picks. But we're having an okay day. Let's throw the, um, let's get rid of this moving average and let's throw the 50 in for Mr. Phil. Yeah, 
And you can see we're almost back above the 50-day moving average. And here's two more things to look at. Now, again, moving average is going to have lag. So one thing you look at is daylight. And notice that we had a pretty good run with lots and lots of daylight since last November. If you didn't know anything about markets or anything about trends, you could say, well, if the market is above the 50-day moving average, the lows are greater than the 50-day moving average, or choose your favorite moving average, okay? For longer-term moving averages, I'm not as big a fan of something like a simple moving average. I tend to use an exponential for anything greater than 10 days. But I know the 50 is well watched in the overall market. I do pay some attention to it, especially when the market drops below it or rallies above it, whatever case may be, when you're in a longer-term downtrend. But again, if you know anything about markets, just throw in a 50-day moving average. Pay attention to what? The slope of it. Is the slope going up? Is the slope going down? Is the slope going sideways? I guess that would be no slope. Is it accelerating? Is it decelerating? And then again, before you do all that complex stuff with slope and angle and all, just look to see if the lows are greater than the moving average. That always amazes me how something as simple as that could keep you, for the most part, on the right side of the market. Okay. So we dip below a little bit, not the end of the world. You take out this moving average. What have we done lately? You know, it's Janet Jackson when it comes to market. What have we done for me lately? And so far, we just kind of traded sideways. That's okay. I would rather this market now, personally, yeah, I'd rather you go straight up and make a bunch of money. Unfortunately, that's not sustainable. I would rather this market go up, consolidate, go up, consolidate, go up, consolidate, rinse, and repeat. In fact, I think that if you just paid attention to markets and you err on the side of the longer-term trend, and if they're not too far from all-time highs, I think you would do just fine. I think one day maybe I'll that would be fodder for some research. I don't have time to do it now, but if you guys have a little time on your hands, go in and look. And that's kind of like, I know I'm kind of doing a Darvis. It's sort of like the Darvis box style trades. But you get the idea that, in general, surprises tend to happen in the direction of the trend. In general, the trend will persist once you have a longer-term established trend. But what happens in the meantime is the market will do some things to try to shake people out. Notice you had a little shakeout move here, try to shake people out of the trend. Had a little fake-out, a little fake-out breakout before we came back in, and then it finally took off. Looked like it was off to the moon here, right? And then it came back in. Looked like it was going to break down a couple days ago, right? And now it's coming back up, okay? Check back often. But right now it's sideways. Longer-term trend is up. Stop me if you heard me say that yet today. NASDAQ, longer-term uptrend, so far in place. Intermediate term, a little bit sideways. But look what's happening today. It's trying to break out. And guess what? Let's take a look at this. I don't think we have a higher high. We're at all-time highs right now, okay? Now, these people back here, when it sold off hard, who call the top here, 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 and here, were like, aha, you see that? I'm right. Well, now you're wrong, okay? Now, you might ultimately be right. Eventually, this market will top out and go down. That's one of the few things I can guarantee but why make all those calls? Obviously, you're not a trader. If you're calling a top every week for months and months and months, then you are losing your ass, okay? And you're not a trader. You just want to look like a hero, okay? Maybe they'll roll you up on TV or something. All right, so that's the S&P. Take a look at the Russell. Russell's a bit of a bummer. I mean, come on, guys. Look at this thing, right? That's a poster child for sideways trading since December. What's that, five months? Okay, maybe more. But it's not too far away from all-time highs, 2% change. Russell's a little bit more volatile than the other indices, so that's not much, okay? So when in doubt, air on the side of longer-term trend. Now, don't rush out and buy a lot of stocks while these indices are going sideways. Be super-duper selective. Wait for entries, honor your stops, and all those other things I preach. But for now, I wouldn't get too excited. 
Energies, on the other hand, not so hot. Look like they could be making a mother of all, the mother of all tops, or a big top, I should say. Battles of mining, these other commodity-related areas, not doing so hot, okay? So you certainly want to avoid those areas. I wouldn't rush out and short them just because they're not at super-duper high levels, especially like the energies or whatever. I mean, if the energy is way up here, yeah, short them. But they're kind of at mid-levels in here. I'd rather go find something to buy or if I'm going to short something, short something at higher levels. Like we were looking at the banks recently. Something like the banks could be in trouble. Now, remember earlier I was going to tell you about bow ties being sloppy and not sloppy. Uh, you could see that the banks obviously a little bit tighter bow tie. Not exactly perfect, but a little bit tighter as opposed to something like the S&P 500. So when you get a tight bow tie and a good reference point that I often talk about with the 50 day, with the um, the bow ties is the 50 day moving average it could be a pretty good reference and when you get a bow tie that comes in this one didn't come in super sharp but if you get, get a bow tie that comes in sharp I mean this is a pretty good example but not perfect when you get a bow tie that comes in sharp against that 50 and sometimes the fulcrum point can be the 50 let's say the 50 goes like right through it like that Okay. Notice the lag in the 50. The 50 is still headed higher, even though the, the shorter term and the exponential moving averages have turned down. But when you get that sharp angle, that angle of attack, so to speak, against that 50, that's when you know you might have a top in place. Okay. Now, as you would expect, like the overall market, a lot of areas have traded sideways as of late. But again, air on the side of longer term trend, take a look at health services. They were looking a little questionable in here, a little sideways, and now they're trying to break out the new highs, okay? So I'm not going to bore you and go through all of them, but that's a reoccurring theme. Uh, hardware was breaking down just yesterday. I wouldn't rush out and buy it. It still looks pretty dubious, okay? But so far, it's not the end of the world, okay? Same thing for software, I think. Uh, not quite as bad. You know, just kind of sideways here, but now it's trying to come back. So air on the side of longer-term trends. Stop if you've heard that before. Semiconductors, a little bit more dubious, okay? But you can see they didn't quite bow tie. Now, again, you got to be careful with moving averages because of lag. But sometimes, if a market's not completely coming unglued, go back to your moving averages and pay attention to what's happening, okay? And, yeah, they have lag, but sometimes as a trend follower, you need a little lag, okay? I probably need to write that down. That might be fodder for another column. And the reason I'm saying that is you need a little lag to keep you from getting too excited. So, yes, observe the fact that this market sold off fairly hard, but then pay attention to moving averages, okay? Plot the, plot the blank chart first, then look at the moving averages. And that might keep you out of a little bit of trouble. It's like, okay, well, this market looks like it's in trouble. It looks like it's rolling over. But I'm not going to get too excited until these moving averages cross over in here. Not that you want to always wait from the crossover. The market begins to implode then obviously it's in trouble and you have to recognize what's there. But when you see something longer term in a trend, it just kind of sideways over the intermediate term, and that longer term trend still looks okay, then wait for some kind of signal before getting too excited. Okay, tons and tons of stocks coming in. Okay, uh, so yeah, the bottom line is some sectors losing steam in here, but I think if the market overall begins to break out, we're doing okay. Just real quick, you can see bonds look okay, pulling back a little bit, kind of cup and handily, kind of bottoming in here. I wouldn't rush out and buy bonds, but at least interest rates haven't been a route higher, okay? All right, let's take a look at some of your uh, picks. Phil says, manufacturing, titanium, serenium, film, electronic paper. Yeah, I bought some um, one of these days. John Bollinger's uh, in the audio and I'm also in the audio and we were talking about it and he builds these amplifiers and he sent me a schematic and you know when John Bollinger sends you a schematic you build you build what he sends you <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna build an amplifier and yeah I do have a lot of Kemet parts I guess I guess that's the same company but see I don't know what they do but you're right that's I'm pretty sure it's the same company okay Harry says I'm long-term trend following mode with Vail bought at 770 what would you be a good stop for this and would you go how would you go about trailing a stop veil? Uh, oh, goodness. Well, I don't know. If you're in, it seems to me that your stop 
should have been close to being stopped out on that one. If you got it at 770, uh, let's just round number, see what that is. I mean, to me, it seems like when, when it shot up here, you should have been a little bit tighter than that, you know, maybe further up. And then at the least, you should be at break even. So I would start with 770. I would just leave it at 770 now, okay? But, yeah, it seems like you, you should have gotten stopped out of that one a little bit sooner. You know, your stop should always be where would, where would I be wrong. But if you get into long, long, long trend following mode, then that's okay to have that stop a long ways away to where it's like, oh, God, it hurt, but I still got stopped out at 200% profit, okay? But in a case like this, it's if you're in at 770, I mean, that's a pretty sizable move. Let's just round numbers. What's that? Yeah, it's 40-something percent up, so that's a pretty big move. So, yeah, I mean, I guess you're stuck at 770 for now. Galt? Is that a shipper? No, it's a drugs, biotech. Yeah, super-duper volatile, kind of all over the place, a little kind of crazy, about a 340% run-up. I mean, I hear you, Andre, but uh, maybe on a, on mother of all knockouts, but that's a little too crazy. Uh, Chris wants to talk about B1. Hey, Chris, good to see you. Chris said some very nice things about me, and I'm gracious. And Chris is also a beta tester in the uh, in the course, so glad to have you aboard. Yeah, this looks good. This needs to go in your um, momentum list. It's not set up just yet. Yeah, it's got some bad memories way back here. Uh, but it's had a pretty good run as of late. Um, it just, I would like to see a little bit more knockout move on that one. So now you're to a point where let it break out to new highs and then look to play pullbacks along the way. PHM for Rick. Uh, home builders. Um, let's take a look at this. This one's kind of wide and loose longer term. Uh, it tried to break out and now it's come back in. So this would actually have to break out decisively and then pull back would be the uh, the next. Maybe this is just a fake out breakout, and that's fine. But wait for a decisive breakout, then look, then look to play a pullback along the way. TRVG, I've been watching that one. That's uh, Travago, right? Um, it's beginning to break out to new highs. Uh, let it keep breaking out, and then look to play pullbacks along the way. So by all means, put that in your uh, watch list. BLDP for Mr. Donald. BLDP. Yeah, it looks great. Let it pull back a little bit more. Let's take a look at the long-term chart. I think I was looking at this one last night. Yeah, longer term, it does have some bad memories. Um, now, that's a long, long ways away. So I'll give you an okay on that one. Uh, maybe a little bit more pullback. Not too much, though. You don't want it to come all the way back to this base. But, yeah, put it on your watch list. Uh, Tahoe, I'm definitely, that's on my watch list for sure. Um, it's bottoming out in here. Uh, I'm not really excited about metals and mining at this juncture, but if I did buy metals and mining, it would look something like that. Uh, so, yeah, I'm definitely watching this one. Uh, probably won't take any action, but it does have that kind of cup and handle look to it. It does have some bad memories, though. Um, I think based on the bad memories right here, I would pass, but it, it has caught my eye. If it keeps higher, maybe on pullbacks. But right now, obviously, um, You want to wait on that one. Pen. Yeah, this is uh, consolidating at high levels. It's certainly in an uptrend. I'd prefer it if it was taking out these prior highs in here. I think in this particular case, I'd wait to see if it broke out the new highs and then didn't look to play pullbacks along the way. If it's a little bit fewer days, I'd almost look for a TKO type move. But... Since it's gone sideways for about a month in here, let it break out again and then play pullbacks along the way. TTPH, that's a familiar one. It looks okay. Um, you know, it's a relatively new issue, so I'm a little bit more lenient with these guys. But it looks okay. Uh, maybe around eight and a half or so. I mean, I can't argue with the setup. It's decent, okay? Uh, the only reason that I'm not showing it... Well, it's, eh, it's got a little bit of volume to it. Take that back. It looks okay. Let me uh, let me pick it apart a little bit. 
Why am I not showing this as a setup? Um, yeah, I really can't pick it apart that much. It, it's got quite a few days of the pullback, though. So if it doesn't trigger soon, uh, maybe uh, take it off your list. What's a beta tester? Um, go in and look at the course. Tell me what you think. That's what a beta tester is. A guinea pig. Uh, this one's got a lot. This is kind of wide and loose and all over the place. I, I think I would avoid it based on that action. I mean, I hear you. It's kind of taken off in here, but it's just, it's kind of electrocardiogram. So leave that one alone. LL, lumber liquidators. Um, it looks okay. I've been watching this one, but it just seems to have a lot of bad memories all along the way. So that's why I haven't gone after that one. You know, I know they had a lot of bad press back then, but you got to remember that markets have long memories. Plug is back. Yeah, plug. I remember that one, and I was watching it too. A uh, little kind of, a little too crazy, and it's. This, I don't like stocks after they make a huge gap like that. That's what, like a fifty percent gap higher. Uh, it's just too crazy. I know Andre, you like them. I like them crazy, but you like them like super crazy. That's an 80% run, like a 70, 80% gap in there. It's just too crazy. I hear you, though. APTI. Uh, no, it's still headed down. But, yeah, this could certainly be like a bow tie or something. The only problem it's going to have is you have a lot of overhead supply to deal with. So if this were six months into the future, maybe I'd be more excited about it. CPRX. I'm going to have to go into lightning rounds. I know I was long-winded. I, I guess I'll give some time back to you guys next week. Yeah, this is one that I'm watching. It's It now has really too many days at the pullback. Um, but I hear you, and it's it's coming off of fairly low levels. It's kind of crazy. It looks okay. I mean, it, it certainly caught my eye. Too volatile, too many days at the pullback. I'd be careful with that one. CBLI. No, it's too crazy. That's that's an Andre stock, right? Five hundred percent jump in like two days. Two or thirty-three percent jump. Too crazy. Okay. Even for big day. Look at it. Look at HV. Two eighty-two. I've never seen one that high. Well, I've seen one. Maybe uh, what was it? What's that shipper went crazy? Dry ship. I M M Y. And Daniel, you're next. I'm going to have to wrap it up soon. Uh, this one's okay, but it's got a lot of bad memories. And then it kind of trades wide and loose. So I think I'd pass on that one. Daniel wants to know about NEWR. Uh, no, it's too wide and loose uh, for me to get excited about. I mean, look, it's, it's way up here. It's way down here. Now it's way up here. It would have to break out and not look back. But I would leave that one alone for now. And then finally, somebody asking about a shipper, Jim, SBLK. I'm still bullish on these shippers, but they are obviously are correcting pretty hard. This one looks okay. It's pulled back in. I can't show you the one I like the most because it's on my uh, service for today. But there is a shipper out there. I'll give you a little hint uh, that I really like. Um, but you can see that it does have quite a bit of a sideways move. It's pulled back. I think it would pass on that one. But go through the other shippers and see if you can figure out which one I like for today. Okay, so you're you're in the um, you're in the hunt. Salt, so yes, I'm using discretion on that one. Okay, I'm still long, but I'm using discretion. Absolutely. Okay, all right. Well, we need to go ahead and wrap things up. We're over an hour and a half. Uh, I appreciate you guys and girls taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Anything unanswered, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, stock picks I probably won't be able to keep up with based on my recent workload. So bring them to next week's show, and I'll be happy to take a look at them. I'll, like I said, I'll try to give you more time next week. Uh, again, any unanswered questions, Dave, Dave .com. If we don't talk with you now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. And, again, thanks again. You're welcome, Sam. Appreciate it.